Welcome to M Squared TechCast. Hey, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with another edition of the M Squared TechCast. Indeed. And we have calling in from downtown Detroit, Lieutenant Governor uh, Garland Gilchrist, who uh, is celebrating with some students there at Focus Hope, because today is Martin Luther King Holiday Day. And so why don't you tell the audience uh, what you're doing down there? Well, guys, it's great to be back here with you uh, today for another episode of the podcast. Uh, we are here at Focus Hope for our MLK Tech Day event in partnership with Focus Hope and Microsoft. And I'm super excited about it because we have high school and middle school students participating in two parallel events. We have a hackathon that's focused on mm-hmm. building a chat bot called Hope, which is helping connect people in real time to service and resource opportunities in this neighborhood. And then we have an ideathon happening across the hall for kids who are not doing a programming exercise but are participating in a persona-based design thinking exercise where they're talking about how uh, solutions can be developed for people to be connected to the service opportunities and the resources in the community. It's super exciting. I cannot wait to see the ideas that the kids come up with when they do their presentation in about an hour. Okay. That sounds like a lot of fun. We'll circle back on that afterwards, uh, see what happens, what comes out of that. But one of the things sure. we want to talk about right now is you just gave me a column uh, last night, and we posted it, uh, and your theme is Driving Data to Drive Reform. Why don't you talk a little bit about um, the theme of this and, and, and what you were talking about. So we'll get people to read the column, but <laughs> you, you can highlight it. So, <laughs> Well, I appreciate that you still accept my columns. That, that's always important, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, this column uh, this this time is talking about how data, information, and evidence are really uh, what we should be using to make all of our decisions. And unfortunately, you know, in the public sector or in government, we've gotten too used to people uh, making decisions based on politics, based on rhetoric, and not based Mm -hmm. on uh, data-based realities. And so what I wanted to talk about is all the opportunities that we have to use data, information, and evidence to make better decisions. And, And so I've had some experiences in my career being able to do that, whether it was when I was working in the city of Detroit to make more data and information available to people through open data, uh, creating an app for non-emergency service requests and using the, the data on those requests to decide and determine what services need to be made available, all the way to now I'm spending most of my first year as lieutenant governor uh, in a data collection and analysis exercise of our county jail system, which is mm overcrowded and, and too expensive, using data and evidence to design a set of policy recommendations about how to reform that system that the task force that I co-chair with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Bridget McCormack, we just delivered those recommendations to the legislature last week. So well, one of the, that information and data can drive better decisions. Yeah, well, one of the things that struck me um, about that is that until this task force gathered the data, we didn't really know who was in our county jails or why. Uh, and that, that just because, sort of blew me away. Yes, because the system's a mess. I mean, we have 83 counties, 81 county jail systems, and 81 different jail information systems. It is mm. the, one of the most unwieldy data management problems um, you could ever see. And so we had a partnership with the Pew Charitable Trust, who helped us in terms of staff and technical capacity and data and policy and analysts to help this task force that was bipartisan that had law enforcement and legislators and judges and people who have been formerly incarcerated and victims of crime all look at the data and then determine how can we make this system actually work? How can we make it be more rehabilitative? How can we make it be more fair? How can we make sure people are not getting locked up for things they shouldn't be locked up for? Mm. And how can we make sure that victim services are invested in? So those were the, mm-hmm. that was what we collected. And now we have more, a deeper understanding of our county jail system than we've ever had in the history of the state of Michigan. And that's a good starting point for going forward to make sure we're doing the right kinds of collection so that as these reforms are implemented, we can think about how they may need to be updated over time. I was surprised, or maybe I should have been, at the number, uh, almost 17,000. Of course, these are 2016 numbers, but 17,000 people in county jails? That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, uh, you can't talk to a county administrator or a county sheriff that doesn't say that their jail is overcrowded. And you can't say, you can't talk to a county, uh, administ- county jail administrator or a county sheriff who says that they're not spending uh, way too much money on this system, yet it still doesn't seem to be working. Yeah. The also number that struck me was the fact that of those people who are in county jail, so many of them would be better served by different services, services for substance abuse, services for mental health support, but they're in county jail instead because we don't have those resources. So these, this, this collection exercise highlighted the investments that we need to make in a very real way. 
And it's skewed more towards uh, 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 people of color. Uh, you, uh, even though that uh, people of color constitute a much smaller number in the state, one in six, 29% of those in jail are people of color, right? You know, ground zero for the mass incarceration crisis that has plagued black and Latino communities in particular for you know generations in America is the county jail system. And so while there has been some improvement over the last you know four or five years, there's a long way to go, you know, and, and we have a lot of work to do. But there have been other contributors to the growth in our county jail population as well. Actually, women in rural communities are the number one driver of the increase in county jail systems mm. in the state of Michigan, which is something that was surprising to me and a number of our task force members once we saw the data bear that out. Yeah, that's I, w- I would have not expected that, really, you know. And um, and nearly a quarter have serious mental health issues. I mean, what what do we do about that? Well, the state needs to make an investment there. The data points to that investment being well warranted if we want to deliver good services for people and make sure that people are getting the care or the treatment they need that will ensure public safety in the broadest sense. And so, you know, the state unfortunately made a choice to disinvest in that infrastructure in the 90s, and we need to um, put the state back on the path towards that kind of investment going forward. The other thing that really surprised me about these figures was how much a role traffic offenses play in people being in county jail. And what that speaks to me is, um, well, when you have to drive, when there's no public transit, (laughs) you know, I mean, uh, I I would think that probably leads to that problem, right? That's a factor in it anyway. It also contributes to the fact that you, this this sort of really vicious cycle that happens. So the person uh, has a traffic offense, and that traffic offense has a fine associated with it. If they're unable to pay the fine, then they get... uh, get caught and they get locked up for not paying their fine. But they also get their driver's license suspended when that happens. Well, if you can't drive to work to get the money to pay the fine, yeah, right. then the cycle feeds upon itself. And so it, it identifies a number of problems. One, we need to really revisit um, how we are treating traffic offenses in our code. But then also the fact that, um, you know, you're being locked up because you don't have enough money you know, we don't, we're not supposed to have debtors' prisons in America, and unfortunately, our county jails are serving as that for too many people. Huh. Yeah. So you've developed 18 policy recommendations, though, based on uh, the survey that you did. Absolutely. And so the next step, though, we, we delivered those to the Speaker of the House and Senate Majority Leader, and now the task force, which will remain intact through September of 2020, switches to an advocacy role instead of a research and analysis role. And now we will work with the legislator to ensure that those recommendations get a fair hearing in the Michigan legislature and that they ultimately are reflected in laws that our administration is able to sign and and to implement on behalf of the people of the great state of Michigan. And so I'm very excited about that process. I really appreciate the depth of engagement from the members of the task force. Like I said, we had uh, people who have been victims of crimes, people who are on the front line of the bail reform movement, people who are uh, county sheriffs, judges, the legislators from the Republican and the Democratic Party. Uh, it was a really broad set of people with a broad set of perspectives. But the fact that we were able to reach this consensus on 18 reforms in the system shows just how broken the system is and how urgent the need is to fix it. Can you give us a couple of examples of the high points of those recommendations? So you talked about one which had to do with uh, the really uh, how we are treating traffic offenses and and really making the bar way higher for when we uh, will suspend a person's driver's license because we suspend driver's licenses for things that are not driving safety related offenses and that just doesn't make sense so Mm. i'm really looking taking a hard look at that similarly uh there was a recommendation to really reclassify a number of offenses to rather being uh, criminal infractions to be civil infractions and rather than being felonies to be misdemeanors which will cut down on just the, the amount of jail emissions that we have, which is one of the contributing things to people having these very short stays in jail. We also put forward making significant investment in victim services, making sure that victims uh, have the things that they need to uh, really be able to rebuild when they've been victimized or have survived uh, crime, and also better information systems for letting them know how the uh, perpetrators of the crimes that have been done against them they can know how those cases are moving along and being processed. So that's just some of the, uh, a taste of it. Um, we looked at pretty, uh, we took a pretty deep look at really restricting the the instances in which money can be used, like money bail can be used to to keep people um, in jail, and we think that would also have a make a big difference in communities across the state. 
Okay, we've got about two minutes left. What else, uh, what other recommendations do you want to highlight? Well, I, I want to highlight the process, really. I mean, you know, it's important that this, this process take, take advantage of the moment that we're in, where people from all across the political and ideological spectrum have seen how broken our criminal justice system is. And I think that's because, you know, it's touched every community. We had six public meetings, and we had public comment at four of those meetings and we had i think you know 12 or 13 hours of public comment from people all the way from the upper peninsula to grand rapids to lansing to detroit and we heard just family member after family member talking about either their personal experience their experience with a family member being being locked up their experience as a crime victim and how this system wasn't serving any of those sets of people and so we needed to hear that anecdotal evidence and combine it the data that we collected through deep engagement with county jail systems across the state and also leveraging um, uh, research that had been done on the Wayne County jail system in 2018 to really get a clear picture so that we can make recommendations that are based on reality and not based on rhetoric. So I'm very proud of that and, and, and looking forward to spending 2020 working with the legislature to have those recommendations be codified into law. Okay. All right. All right, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, thank you very much uh, about uh, his latest column in MITechnews.com, Driving Data to Drive Reform. Traditional four-year uh, students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life, but LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs, too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track. And most of our classes are conveniently offered evenings at our beautiful Southfield campus or online so you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Lawrence Tech, where blue devils dare.